Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Brooks Tegler. Um, this is an episode all about Gene Krupa. Brooks, how are you, man? Doing great. Doing great. Awesome. Good to talk to you. You too. Thank you for being here. I'm uh, I'm excited to talk about Gene Krupa today because he has such a huge role in the evolution of the drum set. And I think a lot of people know that, but there's plenty of people who, who don't know about what his impact is on what we have today. So um, yeah, why don't we just start off by uh, picking it up at the beginning of Gene's life and I'll let you take it away. Well, I think you could probably find um, much of Gene's early life is... is I would say nearly impossible to learn. Um, born in 1909 in Chicago, um, one of the family that started out with nine children, but nine children whose father had passed away very, very early on as far as their lives. So, you know, the the work ethic was very strong in that family, including with Gene. So, you know, he started... His jobs, he started his working career as a, what would they call a chore boy at a music store where his older brother was working, which of course also, you know, piqued his interest as far as playing a musical instrument. And he jokingly says several times in interviews, drums were the cheapest thing in the catalog that he could order. He didn't care what instrument it was as long as it was a musical instrument. Of course, he was 11 years old at the time, so... Um, you know, yeah, I'm sure, like many young drummers, you know, they they caught some picture of some snazzy-looking drum set in a catalog and absolutely had to have it. Well, as far as how that drum set actually came to be his, even Gene's memory is not totally reliable because at, at points he talks about his brother buying it for him. At other points he talks about buying it himself, et cetera, et cetera. He described it once as a, you know, a cheap Japanese drum set um, that was, and the price of what he paid is also varied between 16 and 20 bucks. Anyway, the point was, those were the real beginnings. Um, later on in school, he learned to play saxophone, which most people don't know. But uh, by that time, in high school, uh, he was, you know, drums were going to take precedence over everything else, including actually, you know, deferring to a request by his mother. <laughs> and I believe I've read, I've read also a Catholic tradition that the youngest son is expected or hoped to go into the priesthood. Interesting. And they were, they were a very, very Catholic family. Um, and I think that was the idea, was that uh, at that point... I don't know. I think Gene, at, at one point, they had he had a younger brother who I believe passed away. Again, all sketchy, you know, because we're basically talking about a, a, a period of unrecorded history, relying strictly on Gene's memory from 1909 until roughly 27. I mean, you don't really start learning about Gene's past until he comes on to the music scene with the help of people like Dave Tuff and uh, Eddie Condon, Jimmy McPartland, folks like that. So his early life is very sketchy as far as what we know. But it's it's uh, looking like he started drums at age 11, correct? That would be kind of his, uh, that's the year I started kind of moment? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, he started emotionally. He started by seeing the drums in the catalog and working at the music store. Um, probably... Uh, yeah, I think you could safely say that by 11 or 12 years old, his decision had already been made about being a drummer. Cool. Um, yeah, so didn't we all? I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You see a drum set and you like you completely fall in love. It's funny that that goes. That's just such a universal thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I have the, the the had the advantage of my father was also a drummer, so um, that was instilled in me, you know, as long as I can remember. Um, so with Gene and with that period of history, uh, you know, that was probably not considered a good idea by most people, by society in general, especially where Gene wound up hanging out. You know, places like the Three Deuces in Chicago were not what, uh, you know, most 
worried Catholic mothers were going to be accepting is where their son was hanging out. <laughs> yeah, especially if they wanted him to be a, uh, a priest. That's basically the opposite of that. And to his credit, he gave it a good try uh, and learned a lot about music because of one of his teachers, Father Ildefonce Rapp, who taught him a great deal about music. And he always very quickly was very quick to credit Rapp with instilling a lot of a lot of his early sense of what was important about music. So, you know, the, 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 the short period he spent in seminary school was not wasted as far as later becoming a musician. So, you know, we're, and, you know, we all benefit from that stuff as well. Yeah, absolutely. The whole approach to music in general, uh, how he played the drums, Gene is probably the most musical drummer you will hear. Um, because, you know, stylistically, uh, it was a matter of keeping what he played soloing in the context of where he was, you know. Yeah. Um, hmm. Something that was clearly important to Gene was to be a part of the conversation and not step away from the conversation and just stand there talking to yourself, which most drummers, unfortunately, either want to do or, or are even encouraged to do. You know, you notice what happens with extended drum solos. They're up there all by themselves. Yeah, that's a good and, point. So he's he's kind of bringing drums to the right in the mix versus everyone else can take a break and there's going to be a little drum solo now um, while you guys go hang yeah. out. So it's mid-song is kind of the new the new thing he's bringing to the table. And that, I, I do believe that was something that was, it was a mindset that, <clears throat> excuse me, whether it was, rap or who it was that, that that helped him to make that a massive underpinning of his whole approach to drums. It may have been Dave Tuff, who knows? Because Dave Tuff was quite influential early on too. Um, it, it became essential. Uh, you know, understanding what jazz has always supposedly been about, it's about a conversation. If you remove yourself from the conversation, you're just talking to yourself. Uh, if you're not conversing in the same way that you would if you were talking, then you're just talking over each other. Yeah, really. Um, and so, you know, he always tried to keep it contextual. And, you know, it was it was a structure that whatever, if it was I got rhythm, with or without the four-bar tag, Gene would be right there. And you knew where he was musically, you know, and lyrically. He liked that kind of uh, uh, structure, I guess you'd have to say, keeping it in context, you know. Yeah, and so this is kind of an early, because Gene's obviously kind of a revolutionary guy, so this would maybe be considered kind of his first contribution, is that, like, not being separate, but just really being a part of everything, and just kind of changing the sound of drums, really, at that point, and what the role the drummer has, has played in it. Most. Most definitely. I mean, there are so many things that Gene should get credit for that he doesn't. That being a really critical one, uh, the precedents that Gene set were all his own. People work very hard at trying to pin what Gene did on some other influence. And what that has always done has basically... Uh, you know, minimized his real, genuine, personal contribution. Um, you know, people who will just very quickly go, oh, well, Gene, Gene was just doing his version of Baby Dodds and, and Judy Singleton, which was baloney. Yeah. He, and they would be the first ones to say, this guy is an original. You know, Max Roach once said that he was a, he was not only a devotee of African-American music, he was a contributor. Hmm. That's quite a claim yeah. for somebody like Roach, you know? <laughs> yeah, really? Wow. And the, the Gene's contribution was just nothing short of massive. But he's also been the victim of a lot of eggheads and self-proclaimed experts who will do whatever they can and have since the 40s to to diminish his importance because of their own musical politics, you know, because of who they want to advance in that world of jazz. But the funny thing is, and I say this in my book, 
he keeps coming back through. He keeps, you know, I mean, what the hell? A diamond is a diamond regardless of how many blankets you put over yeah. top of it. Wow, that's a good point. Yeah, you can't hold him down. Like, it just the cream keeps rising to the to the top. Absolutely, and it's something that will continue to be discovered and rediscovered over and over again. And I guess it's part of my mission to make sure that when things do get rediscovered, they get rediscovered with the right information and not the mythology, because he's always been surrounded by a lot of idiotic rumor and mythology because of some other, you know, politics, whatever. Um, There's so much about this guy that people could learn from if they actually knew what it was. You know, and innovations in drums, innovations in playing, whole outlook on life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, You know, yeah, he'll just keep popping through all the time. Well, so on that note, so where we kind of left off timeline was, was in 1927, when he started to kind of to become the the drummer, like a little bit more of a known drummer, um, you want to just take it from there. I think he's starting to get some some recognition as as being a uh, prolific drummer of the time. Well, he was getting recognition all through the the mid to late twenties. <laughs> Excuse me, primarily in Chicago, um, and the earliest recordings of Gene are said to be twenty seven. And that was with uh, Red McKenzie and Eddie Conan, et cetera. That was the first time that people in places like other than Chicago started recognizing the value of this guy. Really, that was the beginning of his professional career. Gene wanted to work, and he would take gigs. You know, whoever offered him gigs, he would take them. He finally, he and Condon, finally went to New York because that was developing as the place to be. Um, Truth be told, what he brought to New York, as far as things like the drum set, was kind of new in New York. Um, Drum sets in New York by guys like George Beebe and Chauncey Morehouse and all of those folks were these elaborate show drum sets. Mm Mm-hmm. Here shows up Gene Krupa with the most basic drum set you could imagine because he doesn't need all that extra junk. And as he put it once, he was, you know, in Chicago, they were jazz drummers and things were pretty raw. He brought that mindset with him and clearly it worked there. And people started noticing that they didn't need 4,000 temple blocks and 18 tom-toms. And most of the time, it was just there just in case they needed it. Why not just get rid of it? So, you know, you look at the early pictures of what are supposed to be Gene's drums. He's working with Mal Hallett's orchestra in in Atlantic City and Steel Pier. And it is literally the absolute basic drum set. Snare drum, bass drum, sock cymbal, hi-hat, two cymbals mounted on the bass drum, and that's all something to sit on, which in those days was a trap case. And he didn't need anything else. And and Hallett's orchestra was a big orchestra. So, you know, yeah, he brought he brought a certain rawness to it that was common in Chicago, kind of uncommon in New York. Yeah, so he's the first person and, to bring that to the attention of the world, because you see the earlier, uh, I mean, before 27, literally at 27 was when that that kind of trap drummer went away where they needed all these little bells and whistles to fill in and you don't need that anymore. So well, it's he, I, talk about ahead of his time. What, whether he was the absolute first is up for debate, yep. but what he did, and this is a lot of it was the fact that he became so popular, became so much in demand by band leaders and orchestra leaders, uh, even, um, composers. Uh, the reason is, you know, he he did the job, but he did it with his own original flair. And, you know, it may have been that uh, there were people who had similar drum sets in Chicago, but Gene was the one who got recognized for it and spread that information to a massive audience, which, of course, once he joined Benny Goodman, 
became worldwide audience, not just local to Chicago, New York, or Kansas City. It was all across the globe. So he can be credited for bringing those priorities to a much bigger audience. So that's Um, his big break. So joining Benny Goodman's band in 34 is, that's when everything kind of, that's the breakthrough moment there, right? No question about it. It didn't happen immediately at the end of 34 when he joined the band. But within a year, yes, it was it was quite an event. And much of that because, as we know, the accident of radio transcription broadcasting and the timing difference between its east and west coast, Benny was building an audience on the west coast he didn't even know existed. Hmm. That included Gene, because as Benny often said, Gene worked harder than Benny did for that band. Uh, And, you know, he was an absolute workhorse of making that band work. Um, So, yeah, by the time 35 rolls around, the end of 35, holy cow, these guys are like, you know, big stars. Now, uh, just to, clar- have... to clarify, what do you mean by, like, the accident of the timing there, like, with the time zone differences? Like, what what is that? Well, the, the Let's Dance broadcasts that were done in New York were being heard three hours earlier in California. And so the, the three hours earlier meant a much younger audience was awake gotcha. and sitting around. So by the time they got to California, he had already built a following that he didn't even know was there. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Stuff like that happens all the time. Monty Python was shocked in 1972 about the audience they had in the States. They had no idea. But the fact that their records and their, their television shows had already been broadcast over here, when they went to do the Hollywood Bowl in California, it was the place was sold out. They didn't mix them. So, wow. same idea. But by the time they started heading back east, at the end of 35, it wasn't all easy going, frankly. I mean, they still had to make that trip back. There were still venue managers and owners who were highly skeptical of this band. Uh, because the band was not doing what they really wanted them to do necessarily. But by that time, it was too late. And all of a sudden, the same people that would be skeptical about hiring the Benny Goodman Orchestra one year just would fall all over themselves to get the band back. And, you know, there are plenty of people whose careers, you know, stood or fell on whether they made the decision to hire Goodman or not. And early on, a few of them fell. Mm, wow. <laughs> so, and Gene was a massive contributor to that. Uh, no one had ever seen or heard a drummer play like Gene. So it was a big deal, which, of course, works, worked towards Gene eventually, of course, starting his own band several years later. But Well, and it's, uh, yes, it's, I'm, it's noted that, and I mean, this is probably relatively common knowledge, but uh, that the uh, the Tom Tom interlude on Sing 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 was kind of a big deal, um, and obviously I'm not as familiar with this generation of music from the 30s, but I've heard that song, and I didn't realize that that was such a groundbreaking um, moment. Well, it was. It uh, frankly, it was Sing 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 didn't actually come around until 37. Uh, what Gene was doing was playing drums that most drummers didn't even pay any attention to. A lot of that also had to do with Gene's innovations as far as the equipment. Yeah. And he turned tom-toms from a novelty into a musical instrument. And of course, he was doing that all through his time with Benny, and probably probably before, but the time with Benny, like the like everything else, success brings with it further recognition, further attention. And there were millions and millions of people all around the world who were all of a sudden hearing these things that Gene was creating himself. And a lot of that had to do with his study of African drum recordings, uh, because he'd been, he'd been hip to those early on before he actually started playing with Benny. They were as old as cylinder recordings. They weren't even disc recordings. They were, uh, 
mostly the Watutsi tribe, they were just recordings, you know, like you'd see with folkways doing recordings of some blues guy in Mississippi. These were just, you know, scientific musical studies more than anything else. But he just immediately glommed onto these things and pulled from them whatever he possibly could. That became the foundation for something that was strictly genes, period which was what to do with, with floor toms and mounted tom toms and how to make music with them, you know. And, yeah, yeah he, he owned that stuff and did until the day he died. Uh, the unfortunate thing, frankly, was that Sing Sing Sing, uh, as beautiful as it was, there was so much more that Gene was doing that was completely eclipsed by that thing. But Gene... Bless his heart, he played that tune until the day he died, almost literally. And he played it with the same energy and same love that he did the first time you heard him play it. Well, that's like the old, uh, you know, you get the band who has their one big song and they have to play it at every show. And if, you know, what do you what do? you do? That's why people are there to see it. Right, yeah. And he was, Gene, if nothing else, Gene was a pro. And he understood, you know, he understood why people came to hear him. He understood that early on. I mean, that was one of the impetus for him to start his own band in, in 1938. I mean, truth be told, he actually started that process at the end of 37. Um, he was actually rehearsing a new band before leaving Benny. Hmm. Yeah, so so, so uh, picking it up there, then he's, he's done with Benny, 37, 38, well, he's out on his own. There's a lot of substantial stuff that took place in that period between 35 and 38. As far as the equipment, innovations in the equipment, uh, Gene's style being solidified and streamlined, and the drum set itself, as what was referred to as a trap set, um, that being made essentially the standard. And you look at Buddy Rich's drum set in when he was with Tommy Dorsey and Artie Shaw, and it's identical to Gene's. Um, so yeah, a lot of stuff happened in the drumming world, in the jazz drumming world, because in those days it was still jazz. Yeah. It made danceable, but it was still jazz. So many things happening. Gene was making a lot of stuff happen, sometimes on purpose, sometimes by accident. Uh, same with Symbol. Gene was responsible for a very close relationship and a deep friendship with Avidus Zildjian, pronounced Avidus, not Avidus, and... He did an awful lot to help Zildjian do what Zildjian wanted to do, which was to find out directly from the drummers what they needed, what they wanted. Uh, and Gene's suggestion about possibly going away from the, you know, centuries-old tradition of making these thick, clangy cymbals and start making them thinner and smaller and even bigger at times. So, yeah, a lot of that was Gene, too. So much was going on. By the time he had his debut with his own big band in April of 1938, uh, by that time he'd been pretty much, you know, solidly established as the guy, the drummer that everybody wanted to go hear or see. And, of course, he established Slingerland Drums as the company, you know, as the one to, to use. And you know that they sold thousands and thousands of drum sets just because of Gene. Yeah, and um, it, he was on most covers of their catalog, correct? Up until like six, the the sixties, is that right? He was on every co catalog cover from the nineteen thirty six thirty seven catalog, which has oftentimes been erroneously just referred to as the thirty six catalog. It really wasn't. Hmm. Most of the Slinger catalogs of that period were actually not published until the end of the copyright year. Because, you know, you look at the cover of the classic 36 Slingerland catalog with Gene on the front, sitting behind the brand new set of Radio King drums, those pictures weren't even taken until August of 36. So it's really the 36-37 catalog. He was on that edition, and every one all the way up until the 67-68 edition, and even that photograph is 10 years older than the catalog. Huh, wow, so they're using back backlog photos. Well, they had to, because by 67, 68, Gene actually retired first in 68. 
He was feeling terrible. He looked bad. Yeah. And I guess I figured the best thing to do would be to put an older shot on there for that catalog cover, and probably in deference to him. Uh, so, so yeah, you're looking at a catalog picture, the cover picture that's actually 10 years older than the catalog itself. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. But uh, all right, so rewinding here. So he's then, at this point, establishing Slingerland. He's helping revolutionize Zildjian symbols by making them thinner, working directly with Avidus to get what actually, what drummers want versus what uh, they'd been, you know, the Turkish style of creating symbols from, obviously, from hundreds of years before. Um, so now we are up to about the, is this the early 40s? Yeah. Uh, it's, I think probably the greatest band that Gene put together, um, although they were all great, another thing that unfortunately critics seem to minimize the importance of all of Gene's bands, but they all were innovative. They were all interesting. Probably the most successful commercially was the band that had been built up since, until 19, you know, at 1941, because that's when the inclusion of both Roy Eldridge and Anita O'Day solidified the band as a big hit band. And, you know, it was sort of typically one big hit after another. It was also important, the relationship that Gene had with Benny, which stayed as a good friendship their entire lives, um, that developed first in 1935-36 with Benny putting together a trio, which included Teddy Wilson on piano, um, a black musician. And unfortunately, even in those days, he could not say that Teddy Wilson was a regular member of the band. Wow. He always had he had to um, showcase Wilson as a feature artist. Uh, and then, of course, later in 36, Lionel Hampton shows up. Yeah. Uh, that whole thing carried over deeply as far as Gene was concerned, and he literally had to fight and argue and ultimately insist that Roy Eldridge would be a regular member of the band not a featured artist, even though, of course, he was featured all the time. Uh, one of my favorite pictures is a beautiful shot backstage of Gene and Roy in the midst of a handshake that is just wonderful. It's 1943, and unfortunately, it was right before Gene got busted. But Yeah, um, we'll get there. They, they were... Yeah. Um, so Gene did so much without even realizing it for that whole situation. Uh, and so, yeah, 41, from 41 until 43, that was a top flight band full of top flight equipment. Slingerland Radio Kings were all over that bandstand every night. And Slingerland and Zildjian were firmly behind Gene with whatever he wanted to do. And that's why, you, of course, the, the band fronts that they used from the beginnings in 38, all the way until uh, the break in 43, there were little 6x10 Radio King Tom Toms mounted on every music stand in the band, <laughs> and they played them. Wow. Yeah, uh, that's that's a cool image to see. And they're great little drums. I own two of them. <laughs> wow, damn. So in, so, in 41, now, because Gene is also in movies at, like, he is just, um, he is everywhere. He is a international star. How did that happen? I mean, uh, clearly, Hollywood at that point wanted to sell movies. They also realized that the musicians, hugely popular musicians because of the music industry, could make them, they could sell a lot of movie tickets. And that had been going on since Benny's first film, which was called The Big Broadcast of 1937, was actually filmed in 1936. And these are young guys. I mean, you think about how old Gene and Benny were in 1936. They were the same age. Um, and here these are guys were, you know, national film stars all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at that, every year, 36, 37, Benny did a film. The second one in 37 was Hollywood Hotel. You know a film is going to be seen by many, many millions of people over a course of time. 
that further solidified Gene's worldwide reputation. Uh, and so, of course, in 38, when, when Hollywood saw that they had the opportunity to even double their profits by, by having Gene as a band leader in a film, that's when the movie Some Like It Hot appeared. And that was actually recorded early in 38. I mean, sorry, late in 38, early in 39. So it was, yeah, Gene was a film star. He was good looking, of course, you know, uh, interesting to watch, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Gene's only complaint was he only wished he could act. (laughs) (laughs) But he didn't really have to. All he had to do was just be himself. Yeah. So, yeah, doing feature length films from, you know, his time beginning with Benny and straight on through. 41 was uh, Ball of Fire with Barbara Stanwyck. You know, we all know the list of the films that Gene appeared in. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, awesome. It's just, it, it's funny because he's, he's just everywhere. I mean, he was a sensation. And you don't, I mean, this this period, you don't really see many other, I mean, obviously Buddy Rich and John Bonham and these guys who were like kind of like the, the household names of drummers. But you still, you just don't really see movie star drummers besides this this period, as far as well, I know. There were a few. Jackie Cooper was a tremendous drummer, absolutely idolized Gene, and managed to get drumming into film more often than not. Fred Astaire was a tremendous drummer. So was Bing Crosby. Uh, Fred Astaire has at least two films where he's, you know, dancing with drums. One of my favorite buddy quotes is he doesn't play the drums, he dances them. But he was a tremendous dancer. So, yeah, the, the two were deeply intertwined, film and music, all the time in those days. Um, and, uh, you know, that started to separate by the late 40s and the end of World War II. But for that period of time, uh, if you were really successful, that means you were working at least once a year in Hollywood doing a film. Uh, and, you know, clearly both Gene, Benny, a lot of other people were. Yeah. I mean, talk about a jack of all trades. Yeah, absolutely. But again, they were much in demand by the industry. All they had to do was answer the phone, you know. Yeah. And then play themselves. Basically just be themselves on camera and play the drums. And Exactly. You're right. I mean, 42 film that Gene was in syncopation. He's always going to be going by his own name. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, he was quite busy. And of course, that that again itself did a lot of musical cross pollination because all of a sudden these guys were going back and forth across the country and playing with musicians in California, and then all of a sudden they're playing with musicians in you know you name it, Omaha, Nebraska, on their way back through. But in those days, they had long-standing gigs. When when Benny's band finished their stint in California and had finished filming the big broadcast in 36, they went directly to Chicago and wound up having an overextended stay in Chicago that lasted six months. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah. I mean, those were the days all I can reminisce about is being able to keep my drums set up for two days, Friday, you know, a Friday night and a Saturday night. Yeah. These guys. And it was that was particularly great because it was in Benny and Gene's hometown of Chicago. So, yeah, they were busy and very much in demand, and they all had big agents, and, you know, it was all it was all a big deal. And they were all there, you know, Miller and Charlie Barnett and all these cats were, you know, just riding that wave beautifully and pumping out some truly marvelous music. Hmm. Now, is he married at this point or uh, still a single, young single guy? Well, remember, this was a, this was a straight-ahead, young Catholic guy. And he and Condon moved from Chicago to New York and stayed. In those days, you could actually rent a hotel room as your apartment. And they rented a room, shared a room, and Gene would talk to the switchboard operator every morning who was a girl named Ethel McGuire. He wound up marrying her before he joined Benny's band because he was so much in demand. He was making good money, and he thought, okay, it's time for Ethel and I to get married. So they did. 
They were married in 34, and they stayed married until a divorce in, uh, whenever that was, 42. So they were married for eight years and then divorced and then married each other again. Wow. In 46, and were together and she, until she passed away in 55. Gosh, and she was a switchboard operator. So he just met her by talking to talking the operator? The... Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and she was also from New England. Interestingly enough, both of Jean's wives were from New England. Hmm. And I never realized this until later, but the, one of Jean's biggest hits was a tune called Massachusetts. And I never made that connection in the past, but a lot of Jean's influences were in places like Boston. Zildjian was in Massachusetts. Yep. Both of his wives, a lot of his life, um, because, of course, he was all over the country. Um, so, yeah, um, he, and, he and Ethel were married. He was already a married guy. Okay. Next to the dis- billions of young teenage girls. <laughs> yeah, but that's good to know. It kind of paints the picture of kind of what, because uh, now everything feels a little different for a 25-year-old, 26-year-old guy. And But so he's a, you know, young Catholic guy, married. Um, so now I guess we're up to, as we said before, that kind of 1943 period where Gene got in a little bit of trouble. He got in a little bit of trouble without actually doing anything wrong. This was, you know, this was again in the days when the the G men were out to set examples. Gene unfortunately became a scapegoat uh, for the, you know, the the feds to make some statement about drug use. Hmm. Uh, and he got hit with it because what Gene physically did naturally, many interpreted as him just being influenced by drugs. He had to have been a drug addict, which, of course, absolutely false. And basically, yeah, he was framed. He was set up. And bless his heart, uh, he, you know, Perhaps if he'd gotten a different lawyer than a guy named Ehrlich, things may have been different, but Ehrlich decided he needed to make some kind of plea bargain, which ultimately wound Gene up in jail, not prison, as many wrongly have said. Gene went into the local San Francisco jail and spent three months in there for something he never did. Well, let's. And, so what's the... Let's give... Give the listeners, so what is the, like, you know, the, the, the brief, like, what's the story? Like, what actually happened? Well, basically what happened was that, first of all, credit where credit's due. A guy named Dennis Brown did a marvelous, marvelous <laughs> treatise on this whole thing. He did incredible research. Gene was basically set up. His band boy had been drafted. His band boy wanted to give Gene something uh, as a gift, as a, a token of his esteem, et cetera. And that wound up being a few joints, which Gene, you know, thanked him for. Gene did not smoke pot. Gene was not a user. But he thanked the guy. It was, you know, it was a, he thought it was a nice gesture. Never gave it a thought. Put him in his, his bathrobe, his dressing gown. And, you know, there they sat. Well, the fact is the whole thing had been set up. And it was a guy named John Patekos who was in on the deal, and the feds sent him to go and, you know, Gene had said, holy cow, somebody warned them. They, you know, the guys in the band knew when the narcs were around. And they, but he said, Gene, the narcs are here tonight, uh, you know, just so you're warned. And he sent John Patekos, his new band boy, back to the dressing room to take those things out, told them to flush them down the toilet. Of course, that was not going to happen because Patekos was in on the deal, put them in his pocket. There was this, you know, fabricated nonsense that the feds nabbed him on the way out, asked him where he got the stuff, and he said, Mr. Krupa. And, you know, the rest is history. He was framed uh, on he never actually was was charged with possession. That's the interesting thing. They had to go for something more substantial than that. So they went after the contributing to the delinquency of a minor charge. 
and that was first a local charge in San Francisco, and then was was exploded into a federal charge. So he then had two trials to deal with. There were two charges literally against him. He had to deal with each one separately. He spent three months in jail for the first one and, you know, was told to come back for the hearings and the trials that were going to go on for the federal charge of the same thing. And at that point, it took a year for the guy to feel guilty enough, John Potatoes, to come back and recant his entire testimony. God. By that time, Gene's career had almost been destroyed. Um, he went back home, he went back east, and just laid low. Wow. It really hit hard, you know, the embarrassment, the frustration. You know that he probably was thinking about things like, what would his mother have thought had she still been alive, etc. It was a massive blow to Gene, personally. Uh, he also attributes the whole experience, ultimately, towards helping him uh, for the rest of his career, but it never did. Every time the issue of drugs came up, anything around the ban, uh, you know, he went and had to go relive the whole thing um, over and over again, all the way into the, even the, the, the late 50s, um, or early 50s, I should say. So, yeah, it, the whole thing was a horrible thing that he, you know, he suffered from it, but not so you'd ever know. And, you know, two of his dear friends, namely Benny Goodman and Tommy Dorsey, were determined to bring this guy back and knew they could. But it took a lot of convincing by both of them because, uh, you know, you can imagine how gun-shy Gene was at that point to sit in front of an audience. These were the people who immediately turned on him when the headlines started showing up. Yeah, I mean, people people like to see the biggest celebrities fall. I mean, that's like, God, talk about something that is extremely relevant today. People love to see the, you know, just... Yeah. Yeah, I can't yeah, believe well, that. Yeah, had this very sick desire to see other people fail because it makes them feel good. Um, it, and unfortunately, it was even worse back then. I mean, this is a period when they had films like Reefer Madness, you know, yeah. And, you know, there was such, such an ignorance about that stuff. So Gene paid and continued to occasionally pay through the rest of his entire career. But he did it with integrity. You know, I mean, this was a guy who was being hit from all sides, professionally, personally. Uh, you know, critics were, were all too quick to trash him, in the, you know, especially in the late 40s, early 50s. And Gene's response once was, well, even critics have to eat. You know, that's the, that's the kind of guy he was. Just to, like, take the high road kind of guy. And that's, I mean, just a true gentleman is, is just what it keeps kind of popping up in my head is just not, just such a good guy. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, Gene, of course, he was not a saint. He was not an angel. He made his, his share of bad choices, you know, uh, inaccurate, stupid decisions. I mean, basically the reason that he and Ethel split up was because of, you know, you can imagine what it was like for her to be at home and and look at the, the newspapers and the trade magazines and see pictures of Gene on the cover of Downbeat having some intimate conversation with Dinah Shore. Yeah. You yeah. know, that, that, that's going to take its toll on any marriage after a while. And, you know, as Gene said, in those days, he, he was a big shot. He thought of himself as a big shot, you know, traveled with multiple steamer trunks full of clothing and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it, it went ahead. I mean, you know, he, later on, he realized that had he done things differently, everything might have been different. He was a high-profile figure. So, and the irony is that you know who bailed him out? Who? Fine got him out of jail was his ex-wife Ethel. Mm, wow. They, they do a cash settlement when they divorced. She's put that in the bank and when he had, when there was, you know, bail money involved, that's where it came from. Man. So, yeah. Well, she clearly knew that he was a good guy and he didn't, you know, every, he's got his issues, but he's not 
buying weed off of miners and doing that kind of stuff. So that's... Yep. That, you read, if, if anybody wants to learn about Gene Krupa the man, read a beautifully written piece by one of his piano players, Bobby Scott. Um, uh, it's called The World Is Not Enough. It is such a in-depth treatise on who Gene was as a guy. Hmm. I'll have to read that. Um, and it will remind you of people that you've learned of later in life guy with just impeccable integrity straight up guy you know it's it's a wonderful article it's probably the best thing ever re- written about gene ever um well that's great so, I'll, I'll try yeah. and sh- share that on my uh share a link to it when i when i uh post this um if i can if i can find it or if you have a link and you can send it to me i'll i'll, I'll share it but um i do um and i can certainly send it when we're done but uh um, perfect it's it's worth reading because it's a real window into who Gene actually was, and not all the baloney, not all the hype, not all the nonsense. Gene was not a drug addict. Uh, as much as people in 1943 wanted to believe he was, he wasn't. Uh, Gene liked to drink. He liked scotch, but you know, no, he was not a drug user at all. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, all right. So after that, after all the stuff that happened with the scandal. Gene's down for a while, and then he, you were saying he kind of, he starts to make a comeback through his friends, right? Well, basically, Benny said, you know, come on up to Connecticut at Benny's house. Come on up and just play some. And you know, eventually he talked Gene into doing that. It felt good. But it was, you know, it was not playing in front of an audience. It was just playing music, which Gene, frankly, was meant to do. It felt good. Benny said, how about we book some dates where you play in the band? And you can imagine Gene was really, really nervous about that. Well, the point is, he was instantly accepted. People had stuck with him throughout and were right there when he needed them. And so he played with Benny for several months in 43. But when Benny decided he had, you know, he had a, he was booked on a West Coast trip. Well, that was a country, that was a part of the country that Gene had no interest in going back to. Hmm. So at that point, Tommy Dorsey stepped in and said, wait, you know, Dave, uh, not Dave, uh, Buddy's been drafted. He has to go off to be in the Marines. How about you play with my band? Well, the fact is, it wasn't even quite that casual in Tommy's mind. Dorsey's idea was that he was going to make damn sure that Gene got back up on that precipice that he had been on before. And, you know, I write in the book a lot of the details of what went into this determination that Dorsey had, um, and it made a huge difference. So, yeah, I mean, he was he, he was back on the scene. He was back in the saddle, and he felt great. So at that point, when that stint was over, he said, okay, it's time to put together a new band, which he did. Unfortunately, the first idea didn't really fly very well, <laughs> but the band was great, the musicians were great, but the fans just were not interested in seeing Gene Krupa's orchestra with a string section. So that didn't last very long, but it didn't take more than a year for the band to reestablish itself as being important. Uh, people came back, came and went. Anita was back for a little while. Roy came back for a little while. Roy actually took over leadership of the band in 43 when Gene had to go and tried to keep the band together, but it just didn't work. Yeah, it's missing its key. Uh, it's like it's missing the uh, the kind of wow factor, I guess, at that point. Well, true, and also the fact that uh, venues all of a sudden were you know highly skittish about, you know, what do we do about hiring this Gene Krupa band? So, you know, the business was was going to determine what happened. You know, regardless of what cats like Roy and Ray Biondi wanted to do, you know, it was really going to boil down to who was going to hire them. So the band just kind of fell apart for a while. Hmm. When Gene put the band back together, 44, 45, and came back roaring. I mean, he came back with all kinds of, you know, new things, playing timpani, um, and, of course, in those days, all of these band leaders were obliged to play shows in all the big theaters. So, you know, uh, most people don't realize that, you know, the band playing a 
uh, a theater like the Paramount involved them also backing up any number of horrible other acts, dancers, animal acts, you name it. They had to do all that too. Wow. Yeah, you gotta but, you gotta work. Right. But by the time that World War II was ending, the whole concept of what jazz was about was changing. And thanks to Benny Goodman's work in 1938 at Carnegie Hall, jazz had been hugely legitimized by that time. So you could literally go somewhere and, and draw an entire audience who were interested in dancing and listening to the music and paying attention, something you don't see anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that was it. And you didn't have to have, you know, ball twirling seals and, you know, <laughs> dog ass. Yeah. So by the time he he put that band together in 44, 45, it was a huge operation. Of course, guess what happened? He goes right back to Hollywood and films in George White's Scandals. And so, you know, he's back in the saddle in every way. He's doing film, he's doing concert tours, the the booking office is busy, busy. It stayed that way from that point all the way up until he finally gave up in 51. Hmm. But much going on, of course, during that period. Slingerland had, you know, because of their, because of the, the uh, War Production Board's Edict L-37, Yep. Uh, had to change all of their rules as far as what they could actually sell, what they could build. And it wasn't really until 48, 49 that Gene shows up with new style equipment from Slingerland. That's a big deal. Everybody's got to go out and get, you know, the latest Slingerland set with the new 561 beaver tail lug casings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. He's, he's their, he's their showman. That's for sure. Absolutely. He was their greatest salesman ever. Nobody matched it. Even Buddy knew that. You know, Buddy knew that he was never going to be a Slingerland endorser in anything other than the second position as long as Gene was there. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, everything sort of kicked back into a high gear in the mid-40s and stayed that way until uh, the whole industry decided to just throw these guys in the trash can and go for a different kind of music that they could sell to a younger audience. Um, you know, all of those all those people who were not old enough to go into World War II, not quite. You know, by the time 1950 rolled around, you know, these were the record-buying public. So, you know, okay, let's dump all these, these big lumbering dance bands and all of this introspective, boring jazz stuff and, you know, and go for Elvis Presley and and doo-wop bands and keep it small and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. So wow. yeah. everything, everything changed. Plus Gene was also still getting hit with his stuff about drugs. You know, cops would approach a side man, a couple of side men in Gene's band, and they'd get busted for heroin. God. And they'd ask him, where'd you get this stuff? And these guys would say, Mr. Krupa. Oh, my God. I mean, it plagued him his entire life. To the point where, in this, you know, towards the end of his life, he was actually doing lecture tours about why it's not a good idea to use that stuff. So, so even then, the guy had a backbone to say, "Okay, I'm going to try to turn this into something positive." So, and he did a lot of that. So part of the issue, I think, with Gene and Ethel was the fact that it was determined that Gene could not father children. Both, and Gene loved kids. He loved kids. So him being able to stand up there and talk to guys, talk to kids about, you know, warning them about things they probably shouldn't get involved with, I think was partially cathartic for him. You know, he could be a father without actually being a father. Yeah, and try and, and I, clear his, his rap a little bit and be positive. Yeah, and, and he and his second wife, Patty, did adopt two children. Um, and as far as I know... I'm still learning about this, but as far as I know, his adopted son, Michael, who also was Gene Jr., hmm. is still alive, and probably my age by this time, I guess, 50s, but um, maybe, uh, was also severely, severely handicapped. Um, and so uh, Gene, 
13 adopted kids with Patty, even that turned into a disaster, I, I'm sorry to say, because for whatever reason, they split up. Married in 15, divorced in 68, she took the kids. Wow. <laughs> so he was in visitation for that. Again, a reference to Bobby Scott's piece. Gene talked to him about that, you know, at times. The, the frustration, the disappointment. So <laughs> Gene was, you know, frustrated his whole life by certain things that were just unchangeable. And not being able to father children was a big one. Yeah, what a poor guy. You know, he's he's on top of the world, but, like, everyone has an issue. Even if you're the biggest drummer in the world, there's everyone's got something going on, you know. You bet. You bet. And he had a lot. For all of the beautiful stuff that happened with Gene's life, he was just not going to talk about it. You know, he was not going to whine about it to some some magazine article. He was just going to keep things up. And, you know, again, you'll never read anybody say anything bad about Gene because that's the way he wanted it, you know. Um, always uh, deferential, self-deprecating, polite, respectful, even to young idiot musicians, you know, even to these guys who thought they knew everything, uh, you know. Heard hugely to a new generation of guys like Red Rodney and Jerry Mulligan musically, and gave them a platform to do what they did to establish their foothold. Um, and those guys, to a man, have nothing but beautiful things to say about the old man, namely Gene. He's a role model. I mean, that's uh, I think the key of everything is he just became a role model for everyone and can still be a role model for people. Um, just how to act that's and yeah essential that he you know that people get that lesson too but they got to know about it you know there have been a few books done about gene that really you know frankly a couple of them were really just sort of picture book compilations that really don't get into gene's biography at all uh, the first one was you know somewhat more biographical but Pretty much all the same stuff that we've all heard. Um, the definitive team group of biography has never, frankly, been done. In my opinion, never can, because Gene was a pretty private guy. So, and all of the people that would know are dead. <laughs> so, you know, researching a definitive biography about Gene Krupa is going to be near impossible. Yeah, because all of them. I mean, obviously, you know a ton, and you are putting together a book, but what you can't figure out what's impossible to know, like about it, him when he was a kid and all this stuff. But um, Yeah, this, this, as far as basic research, uh, the things about who Gene was as a human being were just not really in print. They were not done until much later, the, the Scott article being a huge one. <laughs> everything else was anecdotal. Everything else was... Word of mouth, it was hearsay, it was not provable stuff. Even Gene's memory was not completely reliable, but the fact is, he kept to himself. He dearly loved the house that he designed and built in Yonkers in 1940. Loved that house. He loved that house to the extent that the address was the what was engraved on the bracelet that he wore on his left wrist his whole career. Number 10, Richard Drive. Yeah, that house meant everything to him. How about the tragedy of his last year of life? The house catches on fire and nearly is completely destroyed. God. You know. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. As far as being a role model, absolutely. Absolutely. And you look at what he did with guys like when he was on the, all of the tours with Jazz the Philharmonic. Those guys loved Gene. They had, you know, he was a... He was just a great person, and people need to know that, you know, in my opinion. So I, my book is, the primary focus of my book is really on his equipment. But there's plenty of biographical observations in there as well. There have to be, because the, the two are so intertwined. Yeah, I mean, he is his, he and his equipment are both extremely revolutionary and important. Um, well, and I think you're helping to bring, bring this all 
all to to a new generation, and I think that's what the whole goal of this podcast is. But um, why don't we take it real quick before kind of wrapping up? Let's just run through the last kind of remaining years of Gene's life. Like what happened? I know you said his house burnt down, and I know it didn't fully burn down. He he lived in it in the parts that he could, but um, yeah. So how did how did the end of his 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 life? What did that look like? Well, the, actually, the fire occurred in the last year of his life anyway, early in the spring, April or March. Uh, it's been credited to April 8th. And you're right. it was not The house was not destroyed by any means. It was just a portion of the house. It was quickly rebuilt uh, and sold. And the same family that bought it from the estate now still live in it. Um, but that period from 51, when he shut down the Big Band, started playing strictly with small groups, including his own trio and quartet, started traveling much, much more overseas than he ever had as a band leader. He was the first jazz group as a band leader to bring jazz to the shores of Japan in 1952. Um, He took his jazz trio, Teddy Napoleon and Charlie Ventura, over to Japan. They were the first Americans over there playing jazz in 1952 since the end of World War II. Wow, I didn't know that. And he already had a huge following when he got there um, of the young Japanese Hepcats. Um, So there was much of that international travel, JATP, Jazz at the Philharmonic Tours, all over the world, Sweden, England, Europe, you name it, South America, um, in in my opinion, and that's only what it is, is my opinion, he was doing much more at that point of what he truly loved doing than he had been up to that point. Um, he was a star. He could bring a massive audience in any auditorium to their feet by playing a 16-bar drum solo. Um, so I believe that was probably the last high point of Gene's life was between between probably 53 and 1962 or 3. Um, he was really going strong. As a jazz musician, not as a personality, but as a player. Yeah. You know, that was critically important to Gene. He never thought, forgot his roots were in jazz, not in showbiz. So, you know, that was a great period of time for him. Yeah, back to doing what he, all, what he loves. Absolutely, and doing it with people that he loved. You know, the fact that he could go from doing a concert with Eddie Condon at Town Hall in 44, 45, and then wind up, you know, only a few years later on the same stage as Oscar Peterson, Herb Ellis, and Ray Brown, with the same effect. Um, yeah, he was he was much more deeply into what, in my opinion, he was all about, which was to be a jazz drummer, to be a creative voice in any conversation, and to do it beautifully, you know, and with style. Um, Timex was putting on television jazz shows, other TV stations were doing, so he was riding pretty high. And then the next thing that started slowing him down was his own health. Um, he had been a, he was a lifelong smoker. Um, and of course, because of that, he was starting to have complications with breathing and stamina and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, of course had emphysema and later on, you know, the other health issues developed. He had a heart attack in 1960. He, as he, by his own admission, by 1967, 68, he felt like crap and he thought he was playing that way. So he, uh, he officially retired. Mm. Wow. He came back out of retirement in 1970 because, of course, he had to play. Yeah. So, but, you know, 1970 to 73, he played from 70 until the day, almost the day he died. So, you know, I mean, this guy was absolutely, through the core, a jazz musician. And, you know, he was getting blood transfusions on the way to concerts, Benny Goodman Quartet reunion concerts, God. you know. Yeah, a drummer through and through. I mean, my God, I didn't know he was getting the blood transfusions and stuff. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the classic 
sad, bittersweet story is the third to the last performance that he did with Benny, Lionel, Teddy, and they had added Slam Stewart on bass, was at Carnegie Hall in uh, 1973. And it was the third to last reunion of the quartet. By the time that concert was over, Gene was so exhausted, he literally could not get up. And you see a picture of Benny standing behind him with all of these people on stage, just, you know, showing their absolute love and devotion for this guy. And you can see he's so frail that he literally was too weak to stand up. God. So he sat there, and Benny stood right behind him. Uh, you know, which I think is just a beautiful picture. Yeah, it's symbolic of just how much people care about him and how much, what an impact he had on everyone. Um, God, well, yeah. what an amazing life, and I mean, just the influence he has today. I think people can now hopefully take this and realize a little bit more about the the impact on everything from tunable toms to thinner cymbals to a smaller drum set to everything it's just unbelievable um can only hope (laughs) yeah well brooks now is a good time for you to tell people now that we've gone through the whole history of uh, gene's life where they can find you and i know you're working on a book if you want to talk about that real quick before we wrap up here well, oddly enough, the, my life parallels genes in quite a few different ways. Um, and so I'm not working as much as I used to. Uh, I've, I've maintained a regular Sunday gig here in the Washington area at a place called the Irish Inn at Glen Echo. This is, will, I'm going on, I think, 30 years of running that gig. Nice. Uh, and still collecting Slingerland drums, still restoring, still rebuilding them. Just not as many, because they're much more expensive now than they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and the book I'm still working on. I'm uh, just just about up to 300 pages, and there's still so much more to add. Um, but it, it's been referred to by a number of people, including Mark Cooper, as a pretty dense book. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of data in there. Um, but, you know, my, my examples for that kind of approach were uh, guys like the great John Hancock, who wrote the definitive book on the Goodman Carnegie Hall concert. Anybody who wants to read about that concert or wants to know about it has to have that book. It really, it's really wound up being more of a textbook than anything else, because I get into nuts and bolts all the way through it, because it's never been done. I feel it's a book that needs to be written. Absolutely. And have felt time. Um, and I'm really hoping if I ever find a publisher who's interested or figure out how to publish it myself, um, that it will be the book that people will open when they have a question about a particular drum or a particular set. Because truth be told, there is still a lot of gene stuff out there. Um, you know, it's hard to find sometimes, but um, it's there. And the history... It's all based on photographs. It's, you know, I'm not, I will honestly say if it's something that I'm guessing at, but pictures can tell so much, and there's a lot of data just in the photographs from the very beginning. The, my biggest frustration, of course, is there are very few photographs of everything prior to 1934, because, um, you know, nobody thought we got to take pictures of Gene Krupa's drums here. Yeah. Yeah, he wasn't the stu- superstar before then, so why, you know, that's a good point. Well, I think it's important to get the right information out there, so that's kind of, the, you know, the impetus of the book is based on years and years of hearing people talk about the wrong stuff. So, you know, if nothing else, at least they'll know now. And I've made some wonderful discoveries along the way about Slingerland, about their history, about Gene, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been a wonderful trip all the way through. Um, at being a Slingerland Radio King collector, I have a bit of an edge because I've had my hands on this stuff. I've built it, I've worked on it, I've fixed it. So, you know, that makes a difference too. But Yeah, well, you are the guy, and you have come extremely um, highly recommended from multiple different people. So um, on that note, I'll share your information um, 
in the bio for this episode and people can find you. I found you on Facebook just through friending and then we um, obviously started talking and uh, and here we are today. So Brooks, I mean, I can't tell you how awesome it has been to hear all of this. I've never heard or read a more complete um, history of Gene's life. So I think I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Well, I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to do that. You know, I mean, I'm glad that you're doing what you're doing. Oh, I appreciate um, because it. Because it's going to get to a lot more people. And in my opinion, you know, it's going to get to a lot of people who really need it and appreciate it because of where they are in their lives right now. You know, uh, a lot of us now are looking back at my age. Uh, it's beautiful to have something like your podcast for people who are still looking forward. And, you know, so yeah. hopefully someday, someday all of the, you know, all of this important information will be common knowledge. But right now, it isn't, you know. I mean, yes, the name Gene Krupa and the word drums are absolutely synonymous. Yeah. Vice versa. Interestingly enough, I can think of one other person in music that gets that credit and when you say trumpet people say louis armstrong exactly yeah that's a good call and uh, there are so many parallels between louis and gene that i've come up with um you know his the the level of his importance is just beyond belief in my opinion i think pioneer so, pioneer is a good word um to describe him so absolutely i agree Totally agree. So, yeah, and thank goodness there are things like your podcast going on, um, because it would all just be relegated to some book on a shelf somewhere otherwise. Well, hey, and so, I mean, yeah. nowadays you want to listen to it, and, and I am obviously in that in that world of I love to listen to things and, and get knowledge. It's all it's it's all learning, which I think is great. So, um, well, Brooks. Great. I really appreciate you being on the show, man. I think uh, if, if when the book gets done, let me know and I'll share it with our listeners, and we'll um, we'll get it, get them the link, and find out a way for them to buy it from you. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. I, I thank you for the opportunity. All right. Thanks, and Brooks. Take care. All right. Bye bye. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.